Okay, my computer says that recording is in process. So hello, everybody. I uh, hope you're doing well. If you enjoyed the first week's uh, lesson, and we're off to the second. This one is scheduled for, as I look at my trusty calendar, uh, the 12th, I'm sorry, the 10th, that's a Wednesday, 10th of uh, October, okay, which is a Monday. This class is a Monday. So we had a week off, so that can make me a little spinny, right? All right, so without uh, further ado, let me do what I normally do here. Go to the material, minimize myself, that down. Okay. Our slideshow from the beginning. There we go. So far, smoothly. Not like the glitch I had the first week. That was kind of scary. Things happen. Okay. ENG 102, creative writing. But, uh, you know, I also have to cover reading. So it's kind of a split course. Uh, just to remind you, so it's only our second week. Arrows being bad. Week two. There we go. So this week, we're going to uh, start off with a short story in the creative writing portion, which is usually one of the first things they have you do in uh, writing class is a short story because it's sharp. I'm not having you write novels here. Okay. All right. Here we go. Many fiction authors. Okay, so we know nonfiction is a true story or like a biography, fiction is fantasy, okay? And some students might not know that. Uh, many fiction authors start out writing short stories as their first venture. Venture means trip, right? Or first try into the world of creative writing. Although this genre or theme seems relatively easy to work with, writing a short story requires great skill so what exactly is a short story so even though some students might think well i'm going to write a short story this will be easy i'll just throw a bunch of garbage in there uh <laughs> look you get a great no it's a short story requires skill too but i can show you how to do it so as we see here it's not just a short story what defines a short story is it simply a short novel? What's the difference between a short story and a novella? Most writers, editors, and publishers categorize a short story as a work of fiction comprised of several thousand words. Don't be intimidated when you start writing the words come easy, especially if you, you set up certain times. You do so many hundred words a day, and then all of a sudden you've got 2,000 words, and you're like, wow. So continuing here from 1,000 words, which scared us originally, but generally not more than 5,000. So there you go. <laughs> I said a couple of thousand after a while. You add a couple more thousand, then you only need 1,000, and then you get five. But you could probably do it under five, maybe four. The novella is usually thought of as a larger short story or a short novel. It can range from 5,000 to more than 40,000 words. I wonder if that's a question I should ask you on the midterm. How long is a short story compared to how long is a novella? Don't know if I'm going to ask that, but we'll see. Be prepared. You know, listen to your uh, video that I make here and read your stuff. All right. All right. Mary and Gavin, author of The Sparrow's Mother, calls the short story Bits and Pieces of Life the brightest and the darkest. You know, that's a that's a good uh, bit of information there. If you think about it, because you're making a story. So like, for example, Hamilton might make up a story that he's going to fly to the moon, right? So bits and pieces of life, the brightest and the darkest. So, you know, that means some things that have happened in his life and 
brightest can mean happiest or most successful and then the darkest which can be the most dangerous i'm sure then we just live the dangerous life that's what the tall told me you know or difficult problems so you add those in there and you want a nice well rounded story so next is ideally a short story is life in a capsule you know, capsules are those little pills that you take to get rid of your headache. So what they're trying to say is in a, it doesn't have to be a capsule, but it's like saying in a small box, it's all your life put in there. Those bits and pieces, the brightest and the darkest. The key word to understanding the short story format is story. Don't, don't forget that you're actually writing a story. That's why it's fiction. You don't have to tell the truth you can put a little bit of truth in there but you know exaggerate that like i said temujin actually designed the space capsule that he uh flew to uh the moon in right doesn't have to be true so in just a few words the best short stories tell us a tale of sight sound thought and action that helps us to understand and relate to, I see this is some other good information here. If you can write, like some people have to write like a, what they call a skeleton. It's hard for many people to be really creative. But if you say, well, I'll just follow like these rules. And if I fill these in, you will have the components of a good short story, right? Again, you put in bits and pieces of your life, the brightest and the darkest. And here you write and say, did I write something that had some kind of sound, right? Next, did I write something that people can visually see without a picture? And then was there some kind of deep thought? I just try to check those boxes off. And of course, then there's action, right? And then help us understand and relate to, that's the next maybe squabby here, relate to a compelling moment. Something compelling makes you want to watch, right? A compelling TV drama. If it's boring, you're not compelled. It's like, what? I got on my cell phone and looked at the, the score of the LA Rams. But something compelling, you won't pick up that cell phone. Right? Even if you have to call your girlfriend, uh, Phil Cho. So you will be compelled to watch. What we learn from what the characters say and do, there's that sight and sound during the decisive moment, that important moment that gives us insight into the human condition and builds our humanity. Again, people like reading about the human condition right, which means life and the problems and happiness that we go through. Why? Because everybody's human. So we all can identify no matter what country you're from. And this uh, builds our uh, humanity. So later about characters, plot, dialogue, and setting, more things that you check the box off that when you finish writing, you're like, I'm not sure about the feeling of this, but I've checked all the boxes and you might have something pretty good there written without even really, you know, sweating bullets or trying too hard. Okay, next. The short story versus the novel. In their own ways, both short stories and novels help people to understand themselves, again, the human condition, and the universe, but they do so in markedly different ways. Markedly means very. It's a high-level word for very. Of course, the most obvious difference is length, which we spoke about earlier, something about 5,000 to how many words. Um, but uh, this is not the only important distinction or difference. Whereas a novel might center on one central story, and several side stories that can span an extended period of time. J. 
Generally, the action in a short story revolves around just one incident that happens during a brief period of time. That's another good thing to look forward to. You're writing a short story, so you just have to put one important incident for you to write a novella. You have to put more, right? So that's for your more experienced um, writers. Uh, so, for example, in the second tree from the corner, most of the story unfolds while the main character, Trexler, talks with his doctor during an office visit. Most, see? The remainder of the story is told to readers by briefly touching on several of Trexler's later visits to the doctor. With the wonderfully satisfying conclusion coming just five weeks after the story began. These are, these are your other minor elements. Another difference between the short story and the novel is the number of characters. Pay attention to that too. Typically a short story will focus on only one or a few characters, whereas a novel may give us half a dozen or more. So let's say you only do two characters in a short story. You might have to do a minimum of six might need more depending how um, lengthy you want to make your story. So again, less to do there, folks. In the second tree from the corner, only Trexler and his doctor inhabit the pages or live the pages. In Isaac Bashiev's Singers, the key, readers follow the harrowing, which means like a scary day of an elderly woman named Bessie hearing only a few words from a neighbor and an apartment superintendent and feeling the hovering presence of Bessie's dead husband, Sam. So what this means here, hovering is like standing behind you and you can feel the presence of her dead husband. So that means there's a ghost. She's talking about it. She feels a ghost with, of her dead husband is following her. That's why it's a harrowing or nervous, scary Another important factor in your short story, dialogue. Good fiction that contains no dialogue, only pure narration, which would be you saying the story. The man walked down the street and then he came across a woman, right? That's you giving only uh, narration. Does exist, that's like saying it, it, it can happen or it does happen, but well-written, Realistic dialogue can be a great addition to the telling of any story. And again, that's a conversation. So that's when you have two people. So it's like, again, you have uh, Temu Jan, and he tells Mr. Hong, no, I didn't steal your money. And then Mr. Hong says, I caught you on camera, you liar, right? Now you have a conversation between two people. It's not a narrator saying, well, uh, Temujin and Mr. Hong got into an argument and you know, we need that dialogue. Okay, so putting across my point here, after all, dialogue is conversation. A better way to tell a story than by having the characters speak the words. If a plot is a storyline, it's peopled with interesting, appealing characters, not boring characters, it's very likely that readers will want to know what they have to say. Dialogue is particularly important to movie and play scripts. For more on writing a movie, see chapter six. So that is something we will get into later. Something to look forward to. Okay, here we go. Dialogue serves two purposes in the story, right? Again, a question I might ask, right? Be careful. Okay, I'm just making you nervous there. Okay, so anyway. Dialogue serves two purposes in a short story and in other fiction formats as well. 
to deepen our understanding of the characters and their personalities and to further develop the plot. Right? So, dialogue readers add another important layer to their picture of the author's fictional creations, get a clearer idea of the plot as characters talk about incidents, or conflicts, and say how they feel about them, and are better able to differentiate among these characters. Dialogue also works to liven up any scene and gives it a greater sense of reality. Hopefully you understand that. For example, okay, what's more exciting, again, like I had before with Temujin and Mr. Hong, two people arguing much better than me just describing it, right? It makes it feel, as they say here, more real, okay? And with the dialogue, and the people can actually say their feelings, you can really get a deeper feel, right? If I, the narrator just says, uh, they're angry, right? But the characters have dialogue and Let's say one character says, I'm so angry, I could just kill a dog right now with my bare hands. That kind of gives you more deeper feeling into the real anger instead of just, well, he's angry. But, you know, people get angry for getting a parking ticket or eating a hamburger that they ordered from McDonald's and it didn't have cheese on it, which they ordered, you know, but they took it home. So, you know, dialogue is important here. Like it says, it adds another important layer to the picture of the author's fictional creations, okay? And you get a clear idea of the plot. As characters talk about incidents or conflicts, which are fights or arguments, and say how they feel about them. I hate you. If you were the last person on earth, I wouldn't marry you, you know, things like that. And they're able, you are better able to differentiate amongst these characters. You know, one is a cool, cool temper, the other one has a bad temper. So. Dialogue also works to liven up any scene again, makes it more alive and a greater sense of reality. Well, I had to repeat that. I just want to drive it home. Next, when characters speak, they give us an indirect line into their minds and their makeup. That doesn't mean the makeup they put on. It means their personality. That's an old word. For personality. In fact, author Rita Mae Brown calls fictional speech Literary biopsy, okay? If you don't know what a biopsy is, it's for example, I'm trying to give you a good example. If you have a tumor in your body, they've taken an x-ray and they say, well, you have a tumor, which I don't know, let's say in your lungs, I'll, I'll keep it away from the brain. So the doctor says you have a tumor on your lungs. They're going to take a biopsy, which is a sample of your tissue, the tumor, and see if it has cancer or not. Uh, if it doesn't have cancer, it's probably, you know, easily curable. If it does, well, it's a different story. All right. So literary biopsy. So that means your writing is a biopsy of the character's makeup or character. So as it says here, it shows... If characters are argumentative, like to argue or easygoing, if they're happy or sad people, what they like and don't like, their goals and dreams, how educated they are, because you see the way that they speak. Right? And if one guy just sounds like he's from the street, he might not be that educated. Uh, where they come from, they have a certain accent. Whether they're eccentric, which means kind of like you know, think they're high level or down home, regular folks, their fears and their past. Everything about characters can be revealed in their speech. I don't know if you saw the old movie uh, with Al Pacino um, where he played the uh, gangster um, Tony Montana, right? And uh, 
I'll never forget them. He always said, I hate Colombians. They are cockroaches. And so I never forgot it. Every time I think of, even if someone says, hey, have you been to a Colombian restaurant? You know, I'm like, I hear Al Pacino yelling cockroaches, right? So that's how a dialogue from a movie uh, can uh, stay with you. Here, a related device is the monologue. When a character talks to him or herself, so that's when they you, they sit there and the person says, "What should I do?" There's two bad guys outside my window. One has a gun. One has a knife. How am I going to escape? That's what's going on. He's having a conversation with himself. So that's a technique. You know, or you, or you could switch it, you know. You could have it with a, a lady and she's at home and she's talking to herself. And says, what should I do? Should I marry the handsome guy that doesn't make a lot of money? Or should I marry the guy that's not handsome but he's rich? Oh, I have such deep problems. What should I do? Right. Again, it's a conversation with herself. So interior monologues and dialogues can point out a character's uncertainty. See, they're uncertain, they don't know what to do. Inner turmoil, which means uh, inner problems. Feelings of self-worth, which means you might have a lot of ego. Or self-loathing, which means you hate yourself. Excitement, how excited they get, and anger. The full range of emotions and thoughts. So again, buddies, think about knocking off those uh, boxes. Check those boxes. You might have yourself written a, a masterpiece. Okay. Next is a viewpoint. Viewpoint is another area in which short stories and longer fiction often differ. Okay, that's interesting. Viewpoint. While a novel may have several viewpoints, in Charles Fraser's Cold Mountain, both of the lead characters tell us their take or understanding on the fascinating story of how they met separated and eventually reconnected. The short story generally doesn't have the luxury of space in which to do this, right? It's a short story. Varying viewpoints can also disrupt the strong immediate identification that readers need to feel with short story characters. Yeah, if you, you know, um, if you see one of those uh, Again, movies, um, and they have a lot of different characters. And they're really cool. Has a movie flash? Just the one guy in the in the river, and another guy in downtown, and another guy back in another country. That's really cool. But that's a movie that can be two or three hours long. We don't have that luxury in a short story. Okay, uh, so it can disrupt. You have to have an immediate identification. That's why you only have a couple of characters. You want to identify them and understand everything very quickly because the story will not last that long. Now we're talking about pacing. I'm sure you've heard the word pacing before. Like a person who runs a marathon, he doesn't start when they shoot the gun and run as fast as he can because he won't make, I don't know what a marathon is, 26 miles. And he won't make it. So he has to pace himself and go a certain level that can have him last the whole race, okay? So we do the same with writing. So still another aspect of the short story uh, that is crucial is pacing. So he's repeating himself, the author here. Because there are fewer sentences than in a novella or novel, each must move the story forward in some way. So those sentences much, must have stronger content because you're gonna have less time and you have to move the story so in a novella, you can, I don't want to say uh, waste sentences, but you don't have to pack them so tightly with drama or action as you do in a short story, right? Not the case, All right? If you take pages to describe main characters and set the scene for what will unfold or happen, 
time will run out before you get to the main elephant. Elephants? Elements. Um, oh, dear. Have I been drinking? No. And the reader will become impatient to discover how the issues will be resolved. So they're saying, you don't have the luxury in a short story to spend a lot of time over, you know, describing your characters. You know, you do it big and fast and move on to the next because you won't have that many. And if you do too much, your short story is almost over, but it's like, hey, we want to, there's problems here. We want to get to how they resolve them. You know, does she marry the rich guy or does she marry the handsome guy? Those kinds of things. Short story writers need to jump right into their subject and keep on going. Like I said, just shot right out of the gun there. Right. Which brings you to the end. The best short story endings resolve, which means give an answer to, either good or bad, the conflicts that have been ongoing in a way that shows how the characters or the situation have changed, right? Maybe the bad guy at the beginning changed into a good guy by the end of the story, right? People want to see that. Or he stayed bad and then went to prison, right? Who knows? Effective endings satisfy re readers and often surprise them. So like when I said in those detective things and they have all these different characters that might be the killer, right? You have an effective ending, they love it, or a surprise ending. It's like the wife killed the husband? Oh my God, I never would have thought that, you know? People love reading stuff like that. A jury of her peers, first written by Susan Glassbell in 1916. It's a one-act play, and then later rewritten by her into short story format. It's about two Midwestern women portrayed as dutiful wives, which means good wives. They took care of their husbands and try to do all their wife duties, right? just as men have duty to their wives. Uh, so it says portrayed as dutiful wives to their law enforcement husband's way of thinking. So they're... Husbands were policemen and they had a certain way that they thought a wife should be. These ladies tried to do these things. In the course of the story, these women learn about a wife accused of murdering her husband. Though they know her only slightly, they come to understand her completely through the state of her home and the evidence only they see there. In the end, they do an extraordinary thing, something they know to be wrong, but in the situation, completely right. And he makes you catch your breath and smile at the same time. Wow, that's something. So if you can write along those lines, you'll be a success. Okay. In short, okay, to sum it all up, short stories generally have a simple subject, Usually one that lets the story take place within a brief period of time. So, I mean, you could even have a story, a short story like, uh, what happened to me on Christmas day? Okay, it's the whole day. But you better write about morning, afternoon, and night, even though you're only staying on one day, right? Only a few characters that are quickly developed. Dialogue and action that move the story forward, because that's what, they do, right, unless you have boring dialogue. One point of view, yeah, you can't have a lot of point of views in a short story. A novella, yes. Fast-paced, reader-grabbing beginning. So it's always good to start off with something exciting. That's why, you know, from James Bond movies to uh, action movies, usually the very first thing you see is something really exciting. You don't want to start the movie by something boring and Say, wow, wait till the end, wait after three hours, and then we'll have something exciting. People will uh, leave the theater. A middle that doesn't ramble, but proceeds in a direct route to the end. That's another thing with writers that say they, they can do a nice beginning, exciting beginning, and maybe even a pretty good ending. But all the stuff in the middle is so boring, and it goes off track. You're not following the story. 
right? The story is supposed to be about how they catch a murderer. And then in the middle of the story, you talk, you start concentrating on how the policeman had a nice 4th of July holiday eating hot dogs and apple pie with his wife. Completely off track. So don't do that. Next, a strong ending. See, there's a strong ending. Some people can't do a strong ending. And it should complete the story and provides understanding and satisfaction. Again, if you started the story, it's about catching a murderer. And at the end of your story, you talk about how the Dodgers won a playoff game against the Padres. Your ending sucks, right? You completely went off track. Next, a plot, which is storyline and characters that gives the reader insight into the human condition. Okay, so if one of you guys, let's say, was writing a book about being Korean and living in K-Town, which all the people who don't live in K-Town who are not Korean would be interested to know, how is your life? You know, where do you go eat? How do you spend your day? What are the things that you're interested in? Okay. So that's what they're looking for there. Although some short stories do often depict or show a day in the life of a character, they are not the same as a slice of life pieces or personal essays. Okay. Short stories have a beginning, middle, and end. Don't forget that. Even in the short stories, often called flash, flash fiction, a slice of life piece doesn't have a beginning, middle, and end usually. It's just a slice, as they say, like a slice of pizza. It's not the whole pizza, right? You're trying to put the whole pizza in the short story, okay? Next is... The short story is an excellent and challenging format in its own right. But it has also worked as the training ground for many great novelists. So people who became novelists trained by writing short stories. <gasps> writing a, success, a successful short story may eventually lead you to writing longer and more complex pieces. Beginning of a piece sets the tone of the story, introduces the characters, and of course grabs the reader's attention. Take a look at the following well-known beginning from The Necklace by Guy de Maupassant. She was one of those pretty and charming girls born as though fate had blundered over her into a family of artisans. She had no marriage portion, no expectations, no means of getting known, understood, loved, and wedded by a man of wealth and distinction. She let herself be married off to a clerk in the Ministry of Education. Okay. So, this sets the tone. You really have no, learned a lot about this pretty and charming girl that seems to have no luck. And no guy has asked her to marry her somehow. And instead of finding a good man to love her and wed her and be rich, she has married herself off to a lowly, low paid job clerk, clerk fellow in the Ministry of Education. I choose one of the following jumping off points or starting points, uh, or create one of your own and write a 1,000 word story that develops the concept. Who knows, you might end up with a great deal. So this is for you to practice if you want. Uh, they're giving you the starting point. A huge storm is approaching and a family must shelter an unwelcome guest. Three teenagers set off for a day at the beach. Yeah, you could turn that into a Friday the 13th, right? While visiting her ailing mother, father, which means sick, a middle-aged woman has a telling memory. Watching a football game with his wife reveals an important truth about their relationship to a young husband. That's interesting. I don't know how they would develop that. A great gripping and gripping, you know, grip if I, I, I grip a baseball or something, but they're talking about here that the story actually grips you emotionally and grips your attention, okay? Equally important and a challenge to write is the short story ending, right? To affect a sense of closure without going overboard on the melodrama. So, you know, tell what John wants to say. You know, it'd be better if he says, well, I fought two policemen that came out of the squad car and I survived instead of, I 
10 squad cars came and I beat up 35 police officers. That's uh, going overboard with the melodrama. Here's the ending to James Thurber's well-known story, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, in which the main character is mundane, which means everyday boring life, is spiced up by a series of daydreams, which he's always the hero. They went out through the revolving doors and made a faintly derisive whistling sound when you pushed them. It was two blocks to the parking lot. At the drugstore on the corner, she said, wait for me, I forgot something. I won't be a minute. She was more than a minute. Walter Mitty lighted a cigarette. It began to rain. Rain with sleet in it. He stood up against the wall of the drugstore, smoking. He put his shoulders back and his heels together. To hell with the handkerchief, said Walter Mitty scornfully. He took one last drag on his cigarette and snapped it away. Then, with that faint, fleeting smile playing about his lips, he faced the firing squad, erect and motionless. Proud and disdainful, Walter Mitty, the undefeated, inscrutable to the last. That could be your life story. Okay. Doobie. Okay, now we're going to go into our reading portion. Okay. Beginning the journey. Preparing yourself to write can be as important as finding the inspiration that moves you to write. You must find a place that makes you feel creative and comfortable. Choose a pen or keyboard that works smoothly and learn how to overcome the notorious writer's block. We're all afraid of that, right? More importantly, you need to read as many poems as possible to put yourself in the right frame of mind to create your own verses. Before you write, you need to read what they just said here. Pick up several books of poetry and read them again and again. Also remember to read poetry slowly. It can be a complicated genre and you won't be able to fully grasp most poems with a single read, unfortunately. They go deep. Also, the more poetry you read, the more familiar you will become with different styles, forms, and subjects of poetry, which we're supposed to cover in this class, right? The most important reason for reading poems again that this will train you to compose or write your own poems. When discussing fiction, John Gardner once said that you can write only the stories that you have read. Interesting. So the stories that you read have influenced you so much that they're going to come out in your own writing. The same statement can be made about poetry. You can't write a poem if you don't know what one looks like. So be very hard to write a poem if not impossible if you never read a poem. So reading several kinds of poems, sonnets, odes, blank verses, free verses, epics will expose you to the available forms you can use when you begin to express yourself. Okay. So we have an E alert. You will lose your motivation to read if your books remain on the shelf. So if you just buy books and put them up there, you will lose your motivation. You have to read them. You can't just sit there collecting dust. To make sure that you pick up a book at least once a day, put them in different places all over your house. These are suggestions, folks. Place a book on your breakfast table, one on your windowsill, and even one in a kitchen cupboard. This simple reminder will reawaken your desire to read this and to write. Simple things, simple things, reinforced, making things available. So here's one of the, we've got a couple of reads here, you'll see. There's like three of them. Read poems for pleasure, that's one. You probably won't write poetry if you don't enjoy reading it. True, true. Get to the point where you can enjoy it. Okay. You don't have to love complicated poetry, just any kind of poetry. So your first task or job is to find poems you like to read. That's pretty simple. Also, don't simply stick with one style or subject in poetry. Find uplifting poems you like as well as mournful ones. Ones that you, it's a high level way of saying ones that you hate, okay? Read poems about nature and poems about family. Gather a wide variety of poems you like and read them often. 
In addition to filling your shelves with books of poetry, hang simple poems on your walls or slip them into the pockets of your coat. Surrounding yourself with poetry will get you in the mood to create your own. So they're, they're kind of talking about like a overload here, okay? They, uh, if it's everywhere, you wake up and you know how people put pictures on the wall or sayings, philosophical sayings, you know, I'm better today than yesterday or something. Instead you have poetry, then you'll constantly, you'll look at it and read it to yourself and you'll start making sense to you and sticking in your mind. So you might also consider using outside resources to help you enjoy poetry. You see, what outside resources? For example, go to your local library, ask if they offer or host classes, clubs, or meetings pertaining, which means about poetry. Do the same at a local university or bookstore. Another place to search for poetry and talk with poets and readers like you is on the internet. Do a general search for a poet or a specific poem. You will likely find a variety of chat rooms, merchandise sites, and anthologies related to your search. Now see, that can really help you understand a poem. Let's say you pick a difficult one, right? Because remember it said pick mournful ones, you know? So if you do that and then you put it on the website, you're going to get all these people who can read and maybe do high level poetry. And then they'll have, it's like, it's almost like cheating for you, right? They'll have all their answers there for you. Well, the poem actually means this. And the, when the cat, you know, made a cup of coffee for the dog, what it actually symbolizes is the peace between two different countries that were fighting before, right? And you're like, I had no idea. I just thought the dog was a regular customer at the Starbucks, right? So all of a sudden now, these things will make sense to you. And maybe a little entertaining, you know? You won't have to come across with the answers originally. So other people will have them for you, okay? Here's another reading. Like I said, we have about three of these. So reading poems for reflection. Sometimes people might ask me, what is reflection? Um, okay. Have you sometimes, oh, I'll go back to a coffee shop, right? <laughs> Starbucks. Uh, Young people will be in a Starbucks and they'll probably be studying on their laptop, okay? So let's say you walk by a Starbucks on a rainy day and uh, you see an older fellow, no laptop, and he's just sitting there kind of looking into space, slowly slipping his coffee and thinking this person is reflecting on their life. They're thinking, boy, when I was 20, I had too many girlfriends, and then I was 30, I married the first girl that gave me a kiss or whatever, and they're thinking about their life because they're much older, right? That's reflection. So here we go. Once you had found a number of poems you enjoy, you should reread them and begin to contemplate or think them more deeply. Ask yourself why you like each poem. Is the poem funny? Is it thoughtful? Does it remind you of someone you love? Oh dear, love. What, I have to ask Inkujin, what is love? It's interesting. I know what a Big Mac and a double cheeseburger are, but love, I don't know. With practice, you will begin to notice which lines have specific effects on you. Lines of the poem. Uh, remember these when you write your own poem and incorporate them okay, to your writings. You should also consult the dictionary each time you come across an unfamiliar word. That can happen to me too. And I'll have to get a dictionary and say, what the hell was this guy talking about? And always consider all of the possible meanings listed. Even if you think that you know the meaning of the word, look it up anyway. So that's the old just in case clause. Common or familiar words may have additional meanings you're not aware of. And the writer may have chosen the word for its duality or to create a play on words. Okay. So a lot of uh, duality, uh, people use words for double meanings and creating plays on words. So 
those are good things to look for. You'll add an extra meaning to what you're writing. It is a good idea to reflect on what you have read for five or 10 minutes immediately after setting down your book. Studies show that this can increase your retention, which means reading understandability, rate up to 40%. Because some people just read something quickly and then put the book down and then go, you know, go have a Big Mac. And then you talk to them, what do you remember? Uh, so the book was about a mouse. And then he got a driver's license. And I don't remember where he drove after that. It's like, no. You're going to have to do these rereads and then immediately thinking about it before you do anything else. Okay. In addition to making time for personal reflection, try to engage in conversation with someone about the information you read. That also helps. Have your buddy with you and... Uh, you know, say, hey, I just read this uh, poem and then I talked to you about it. What does it mean to you? Right. And then read on the one about the cat making the coffee for the dog. See what he says. Another way to reflect on poetry is to memorize poems. That, that helps, especially if they're not too long. You may have memorized and recited or spoken lines at several points in your education. But the pressure of performance for a grade is long gone. Okay. You can now memorize poems to recite to friends and loved ones or just to remember in your own mind. The exercise of memorization will sharpen your attention to future poems and familiarize you with the certain forms and style. Okay, here we go with another one. Read poems for study. As you read, you should create a dialogue with the poems. By writing your responses and questions in the margins, you can become more engaged in the study of poetry or more active. If you cringe, which means kind of, you know, cringe is like when you see a horror movie or something, you close your eyes and, you know, open your mouth and grit your teeth. So that's cringe. So if you cringe at the idea of writing in a book, then buy a second copy or have lots of post-its or note paper ready to keep track of your thought. There are several things you can take note of when reading poetry. You can write out your impressions, the definitions of your words you look up, questions about passages that puzzle you or confuse you, that's what puzzle means, and any observations you make about the poet's use of language. These last observations are particularly important because they will aid you or help you in the next steps of your poem study, line by line analysis. You'll have to do that to really dig into the meaning. You will read more about such analyses later in the book, the scope about poetry we're getting into. But for now, you should try to jot down or write down a few key observations about the lines you read. How many words and syllables does each line contain? Because you can kind of follow poem by the lines by sound and uh, syllables, meter. What sorts of words come at the end of each line? Do you detect any rhyme? Yeah, is there rhyming in the poem? This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home, right? Do the sentences in the poem end when the lines end? Or do they go beyond the line break? Are the sentences short or long? Do you see places where the poet chose not to use complete sentences? See, there's a lot to study here, right? If you can answer each of these questions about a single poem, you will gain much insight into the writing of poetry itself. Finding similarities and differences between your poems and those of published writers will reveal your own writing strengths and weaknesses. You can take this information and apply it to your own writing while composing or editing. So composing is putting it together and editing is fixing your finished product.
Okay. How to beat writer's block. If you don't know what writer's block is, I'm gonna let you know now. The older writers are scared of this. At some point in your writing journey, you will come to a screeching hall, which screeching is a sound your brakes make when you're speeding and then you slam on the brakes. Perhaps you will be writing late at night and lose your energy. Maybe you will come to pause at the end of a stanza and your inspiration will suddenly vanish or disappear. Perhaps an idea will move you to your typewriter, but the sight of the blank page will shut down your thoughts. Oh my God, it's blank. I haven't put a word down. What do I do? How do I start? Whatever you do, don't despair. Don't worry. There are ways to unlock writer's block. If a blank sheet of paper intimidates you or the glare of your empty computer screen immediately freezes your thoughts, consider using doo -doo -doo -doo, another material for a first draft. If you find your greatest inspiration comes when you're sitting in a bar or a restaurant, gather up some cardboard coasters or paper napkins for scrawling notes and ideas. An informal approach may relieve some of the pressure. First thing you should always do when you hit a mental roadblock is silence your internal naysayer. A naysayer is someone who says it cannot be done. So in other words, they're, they're using fancy language. Um, they're trying to say, Stop your negative thoughts. This is the voice in your head that constantly scolds you as you write saying, that's not the right word, or those words don't rhyme. The first draft, or the first one that you write, belongs to the creative free spirit and impulse that brought you to do your writing place. And you must allow the impulse free reign, no matter how many mistakes you are making. So just give it up. Whatever comes out of you, comes out of you. Your first draft is not your finished product. That's what they're saying. Once you have a draft or two of your poem completed, you can switch on your internal editor again. So if you're more or less said uh, that's your finished product, then you can start editing. But never do it on the first try. You're going to have mistakes or things that don't come together or don't sound right or you think about it and you say, oh, I can improve this, right? So that's what they're saying here. Next is free writing. Part of the difficulty with writer's block is that it often freezes you both mentally and physically. Not only will your brain shut down, but you might also find it hard to tear your eyes away from the blank page or get up from your chair. Yeah, some people can just sit there endlessly and not do anything, but get up and move around. Free writing is a good remedy for writer's block because it forces you into the physical act of writing. It gets your hands moving again and jogs your brain back into action. To free write, you need your writing tool of choice. Again, a uh, nice pen, marker, whatever it is, pencil, some paper, and often 10 interrupted minutes. Free writing is a sort of rant on paper, a stream of conscious exercise. You might find it useful to begin with a prompt, write out the prompt, and then finish it with 10 minutes of steady writing. Here's a list of prompts you can try. One, blank makes me angry because. Two, I like to eat blank because. Three, I'm going to talk to tomorrow, no, blank tomorrow. The last time I saw blank was. So uh, this is not forcing you to think of something creative. You just take it from there. Everybody knows what makes you angry. So you don't have to think about it. You just say, uh, Greasy hamburgers make me angry because, and then you start writing, right? I like to eat. These are not things that you'd have to think about or use a dictionary for right away. You know, you like to eat uh, bulgogi because it's delicious or protein. So this is your free writing, just flow. And you're not thinking about mistakes or being creative, you know, cool. You're just writing the information down and that'll get you in the mood of writing and actually doing. You should not stop writing at any time during those 10 minutes. Don't answer the door, don't get a snack, don't pet the dog, don't answer the phone tell me which I need if it's your girlfriend. The purpose of the exercise is to get your ideas flowing again. You feel yourself getting stuck? Write the last word you set down over and over again until you get back on track, right? Just don't give up. And above all, don't stop to correct mistakes. This is not about editing here. It's free writing. 
keep at your task for the entire time. Stop only when your clock or timer reaches the 10 minute mark, okay? You can do that, that'll help you get going. It's like warming up your car on a cold day. You gotta wait about 10 minutes of warm up time if it's that overnight and there's like ice on your car, okay? Then we have keeping a journal. Journal is a private collection of writing that you add to every day. You should approach the task at the same time each day to create a habit that will become more and more natural. Your mind will come to see that time as writing time. So if you say three o'clock every day, I'm gonna write something in here. It doesn't have to be important. After a while, your body and mind is gonna say three o'clock, I gotta write something. Even if it's garbage in my mind, I'm writing at three o'clock. And hopefully this will prepare your brain for creative thought. The word journal, journal, comes from a French word meaning daily. The word diary comes from a Latin word meaning day. The related word with Latin roots, diurnal, also means daily and was an archaic word or old word for diary or journal. Yes, my daily, that's a oh, long time ago, before I was born. And I was only born in 1999. Okay. Uh, a journal is not exactly the same thing as a diary. A diary is a companion with whom you share your thoughts, feelings, hopes, and fears. Certainly, you can write about these things in your journal as well, but the journal is also a place for you to try out exercises, uh, experience with ideas, or if you wish, expand on free writes you have done at other times. But in general, a journal should not be filled with free writing exercises. Should not. Is a place for more thoughtful, careful writing that you can undertake without distraction. These exercises that you attempt in your normal journal can come from this book, uh, from teachers and friends, from your own invention. If you have trouble starting a journal, make a list of your dreams, fears, and dislikes, loves, and so on, as you would in a diary. You can treat your journal as a camera. Walk around your house, your workplace, or a favorite park and simply record your reactions as you go. People, places, sights, sounds, or whatever else presses you. Using keywords. Another source of inspiration is a list of keywords. The keywords themselves aren't special. You can find them by opening a book, newspaper, or magazine to a random page. Go through that source and jot down or write down every fifth or sixth word that you see including nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Avoid prepositions, articles, and conjunctions until you have a list of about 15 words. Then begin writing, and as you write, drop in your keywords when they seem appropriate. You don't have to use all of the words on your list. You don't have to use any words on the list. But creating that list will physically engage you in the task of writing. Again, just doing something to get your writing skills going. Another way to create a list of keywords is to start with a word category such as colors, sounds, foods, etc. Next, jot down four or five words under each category. Once you have created your list, you can begin writing using whichever words you please. Okay. Again, you don't have to use all the words on the list, but creating a list will get you going. That's the main point here, getting going. And our final point for this week, Knowing when to quit. As a poet, your primary goal is to produce poetry. You may write poetry for publication, for sharing with friends and family, or just for venting personal frustration, which means getting out your own personal anger. But finished poems will still be your objective, your goal. While building a routine, keeping a journal, finding a writing space are all good ways to become a more productive poet. You should also know when to simply set your writing down and walk away. If you're not working under a strict deadline, it is important that you take adequate breaks from your writing. If you stare at a piece of paper or keep your hands on the keyboard for too long, you will likely begin to suffer from aches and pains, not to mention writer's block. Instead of forcing yourself to create something, go work on another project, fold some laundry, or take a walk until you feel refreshed might also want to pick up a book and read during your break. 
So you still be focusing on a page filled with words. The words are not your own. This will help your mind relax. You won't worry about them. When you return to your writing, you will have a clear perspective and uh, perhaps some new ideas to work with. Of course, taking too many breaks or repeatedly finding excuses not to write will not leave you with much finished poetry. So try your best to abide or follow your routine and take breaks only when you really need them. Sometimes you will just know it's time to quit, but there will also be circumstances in which if you just press on a little longer, an epiphany, which means a great idea, might be around the corner. Okay. So let's move on to questions. Okay. Creative writing question one. The best short stories tell us a tale of what? Okay. That should be pretty easy. Two, generally the action in a short story revolves around what? Tell me what it is. Three, what are the two purposes that dialogue serves in a short story? I told you I might ask that. Here it is. Four, the best short story endings resolve what? And five, the beginning of a piece, a short story, does which thing? So what do you do in the beginning? Now our poetry question. What is the most important reason for reading poems many times? Okay, I kept on mentioning the number. You, you read for this, you read for that. So what are the three read poems for reasons? So that's easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Oh, there's a rhyme. Eight, what is a good remedy for writer's block? So what's a good technique for defeating it? Nine, what are some benefits of keeping a journal? So make me a list again. As I've said before, if you only write one, you're not going to get the full point. If you write two, you do a little better. But the person that writes three or four, because some benefits, you'll, you'll get all the points. Ten, explain knowing when to quit. What does that mean when you should know when to quit? All right. So stop share. I'm back. Hello. So that's it for week two. Hang in there. Uh, I hope this is a little bit entertaining for you. And uh, we'll get into three next time. So until then, I shall see you soon.